Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Is it warm in here this morning or is it just me? I think it's my age. <clears throat> now, it's already been mentioned that it's Valentine's Day. So obviously, done the business. Jill got the full works, flowers, pff, bottle of wine, bottle of Prosecco as well. Pushed the boat out. I've been away for the week, so I thought I'd better make an effort. And of course, I've got mine on. There we go. <laughs> and if we look at this slide, now, the best Valentine we can get is this. John three, sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should no longer, should not perish but have everlasting life. And if we see down the middle, it's been cleverly put together so that it actually reads Valentine. So whether you've got a card or not, the best Valentine you can get today is this one. Okay? Now, to start off this morning... For some reason, I always like to try and do things a little bit differently. So, we're going to play a video, not all of it, you'll be pleased to know, of a song that was quite popular a few years ago, and you either loved it or hated it. So, any minute, just takes a little while, and the song will come on. What's going on? Hands up if you love that song. Oh, quite a few. Hands up if you hated it. Quite a few as well. There, there weren't many surprising hands up when, when I said I hated it. I knew we were going to put the hand up already. Uh, Jill would have been here today supporting me, but because it was Valentine's Day coming up, I thought, I know, I'll do the hoovering. So I was hoovering yesterday at the bottom of the stairs. Now, Henry Hoovers are quite easy to see. You can see a Henry Hoover, can't you? And as she's walking downstairs, what did she do? She tripped over Henry. And a foot that she broke a few years ago, she thought she broke it again, but it's not. I dropped her at the walk-in this morning and then left her to come here. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, she's back home now. It's just the tendons. I thought it would be tendons. It's, it's not broken, so that's good. She's okay. Now then, two jokes to start with. Nothing to do with the sermon, just basically to chill us, get us relaxed. Parishioners arrived at their local church for morning worship to discover that the doors were locked and bolted. And there was a note from the minister hanging from the door, and it said this, You have been coming here long enough, now go and do it. Very sobering, thought sobering that one. And then this one, Preacher! Can everyone hear me at the back? Voice from the back. Yes, but I wouldn't mind changing seats with someone who can't. <laughs> I hope there's none of that this morning. Okay? Right, I've got the story of confrontation. Elijah and the confrontation at Mount Carmel. I thought because it was Valentine's Day, I might get away with calling it Mount Caramel. You know, the link, the chocolate, but we'll stick with Mount Carmel. For this morning, and, and this story is all about confrontation and about Elijah being really very courageous and very brave. Uh, it's about beating the odds, it's about persevering, it's about to keep going, keep pressing on, keep pressing in. Now, the background was 
But God, as we heard from John last week, had looked after Elijah. He looked after him throughout the drought. He provided for him. And Elijah went to Mount Carmel and he challenged the king because, you know, Elijah, they were trying to blame Elijah for the droughts. They were trying to blame Elijah for the troubles. But Elijah stood up to King Ahab. And again, as we heard last week, Ahab was the nastiest, the most horrible king that ever ruled. Most of the kings were not very nice, but Ahab was top of the league, as it were. And Elijah, it says that Elijah actually taunted them. You know, we see boxers when they're getting ready for a a boxing match. They stand together, they stand eye to eye in the press conferences, and they goad each other, they taunt each other. And and we're told in the Bible reading that Elijah actually taunted the, the false gods and the king as he challenged them. He spoke about the false gods of Baal and, you know, of the sacrifices. And he said, if your God is real, if your God is true, then let him set fire to the sacrifices and we'll worship him. And then I will pray to my God and if he sets fire to the sacrifices, then we should worship him. And the story goes that God showed up The priests were killed, and they all worshipped God. And to top it all, the drought, which again I think we heard last week, that very same day, after three and a half years, ended. And of course, this upset Jezebel the queen, and she became very angry and very furious. And so Elijah ran away because he feared for his life, so he ran away to the desert. Now, kings in general speaks of faithfulness, speaks of loyalty to God. When the people follow God, things seem to be running smoothly. Things seem to be going okay. But when they disobey, that's when the disasters come. The tough times come. And so God sends prophets. He sends spokesmen. But the people continue to ignore him. Kind of reminds you of society today, really. People come. The prophets come. The spokesmen come. And yet society in general tends to ignore them. And you know, the thing is that God, God gets no pleasure or got no pleasure then and he gets no pleasure now from any of this story really. All he wants is people to follow him and people to obey him. Now we all love a story, don't we? We all love a story about beating the odds, the upset, the underdog, the giant killers, If we were betting people, we would love the FA Cup giant killers. We would love the person that beats a life-threatening disease or illness. We love the person who beats a major disability. We love the person who, against the odds, becomes a success after being labeled a failure. We love the boxer who wins the fight that he should never win. The underdog, the no-hoper, the waster. The no chance at all scenario. I'm sure we've all heard that. But we look at this story and, you know, if we're betting people, what were the odds? Well, the odds were this. 450 prophets of Baal. 400 Asherah goddesses. That's not Alan Shearer. That's Asherah. I know some of us would like to think that it's Alan Shearer, but the Asherah goddesses. So if there's 400 450, I calculate that, that the odds, really, if we're going to look at odds, is 850 to 1. Now, if you're a betting man and you put that on and it comes up a winner, that is a good bet. Not that I know a lot about betting, but that is a good bet. Okay? But it was a risky bet. Every bet's risky in my book, but what if you win? What if your bet comes in? You know, realistically, people must have thought that Elijah was pretty crazy. Hence the link with the crazy frog. It's not fantastic, I know, but you know, it's okay. That's the link. They must have thought that Elijah was crazy. Probably a little bit mad. But you know, Elijah's obedience was positive. And it was positive because of these three reasons. His discernment of the will of God. In other words, he was in tune with God. He listened 
to what God was saying to him. He prayed to God in order to listen. I would imagine he spoke to other followers in order to listen to what God was saying to him. He had a commitment to the will of God. He was serious. He was serious about following God. When we committed to something, we're serious. If we're a sportsman and we want to get better, we're committed to that cause. If we're a musician and we want to play better, we're committed to that cause. If we're an athlete and we want to run faster and win more races, we're committed to that cause. It should be no different as a Christian. He was committed to the will of God. And here's the thing. He had an enjoyment of the will of God. Sometimes we don't have enjoyment of the will of God. You know? And we need an enjoyment of the will of God. And by an enjoyment, I suppose what I'm trying to say is a passion. A passion. Because when you've got a passion, you tend to enjoy it. If you're just going through the motions, we don't enjoy it. But when we've got the passion there, it is more enjoyable. Elijah's obedience was also progressive. And what I mean by that was, it got better. He wasn't the finished article. He wasn't perfect, as are none of we. We're not perfect. We're not the finished article. In truth, we probably never will be. But it's all about being progressive and growing daily. He was aware of that fact. He was aware that he wasn't the finished article. He knew that the action he must take at Mount Carmel could be socially awkward. How many times does our Christianity sometimes put us in awkward positions? Socially. With family. Sometimes. And as a result, he knew that what he was doing could actually get him publicly attacked. Today, that could still apply. There's places, we're very fortunate in this country, but there's places where people get publicly attacked for speaking up of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even if not physically, we can be verbally attacked. So we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same position as Elijah on a daily basis. At work, in our community, and even with our family and friends. Also, his obedience was productive. The enemies of God were defeated because Elijah took a risk. If he'd not taken a risk, Baal would have still ruled, the goddesses would have still been around, the false sacrifices and worship would have continued. But the enemies of God were defeated because Elijah was prepared to take that risk. The reality of God was revealed. His action displayed what he was speaking about. So it wasn't just talk the talk, which we all do sometimes. We all fall short. We talk the talk. We don't always walk the walk. That's our goal. That's what we want to progress towards. But we don't always do it. But Elijah did on this particular occasion. And the sovereignty of God was acclaimed. The people changed. The people, have got, the people turned back to God and they worship him. They worship the true God. I would imagine there were probably some that didn't because society then, I would imagine, was no different to society today. Some would follow and some would not. But Elijah confronts the situations. The prophets of Baal, King Ahab. But in verse 30 to 32, this is what it said. But firstly, he built an altar and prayed earnestly. He was moved by their sinfulness. He was moved by their wrongdoing. His heart went out to them. He was asking God to do whatever it takes to get the people's attention. So his heart went out to them. He had compassion. He prayed earnestly. And he built an altar. I remember years ago when I first went to be a Salvation Army officer, which is donkeys years ago, uh, I always remember... My dad spoke at my farewell, whatever you called it, to go to the Bible college. And the verse that he gave us was, wherever you move, wherever you live, the first thing you do, as soon as you get into your new house, you build an altar. And that's what Elijah did. 
he built an altar. So wherever we are, if we move house, if we go to live in another country or another town, first thing you do, yeah, take all your belongings, take everything that you need, but firstly, build an altar to God. So what does this story tell us about our walk? How is it relevant to us today? Well, I think what it's trying to say, part of it is we can't have one foot in heaven and one foot in the world. It doesn't work. We can't be a chameleon that when we're out and about, we're this person, and then when we come to church, we're this person. Yeah, we're not going to be perfect. I get all that. That's great. I understand that. But we can't have one foot in this camp and one foot in this camp. We have to be in one or the other. The other thing I would say is, what is our Mount Carmel this morning? Where do we need victories in our lives? Where do I need victories? Where do you need victories? Where do we need victories in our church? Where do we need victories in our work? Where do we need victories in our families, in our communities? I wonder, when did you last beat the odds? Now, I did ask the youth to try and get them involved to tell me when they last beat the odds. And the idea is they're going to come up here and say, well, I beat the odds. And it can be anything. And uh, so I think Susan's going to tell us, Emily, Sean couldn't think of anything, which I don't believe. I'm sure that young man has beat the odds many, many times. It's the first time I've seen him speechless. But that's okay. So have we got the uh, other microphone? Yeah, please. And Susan's going to tell us about a time when Emily beat the odds. Yeah, the other microphone, where is it? Oh, cheers, thank you. Are we on? Yeah. Yeah. When Emily was five... Um, she actually made our second trip to Africa with us and we were with a group of people a group of young people for about three weeks in Durban and we were working in an inner school well the school was um, a primary school which meant the children were seven years to about 14 years and as you can imagine it was pretty daunting in there being the only white people around and obviously she was the only little tiny one among a sea of, of black faces, very alien to us, obviously very alien to Emily. And our young people were absolutely fantastic. There were a lot of things she ended up doing only because they encouraged her to do it. We might have actually said to her, no, we'll we'll just leave that and sort of protected her a bit. But eventually we got out into the the yard with the young people and played games with them. We were actually actually painting their hall, so we weren't in the classrooms. So our contact with the, the young folks and the children was actually in the yard at break time. So eventually Emily would go out into the yard with the young folks, play games with, with the, the kids in the yard. And we realized how very athletic these children were. They were, doing all, they were running all over the place. They were going absolutely wild. It was very strict in the classroom. So once they, get out, they got out into the yard, they went absolutely bonkers. They were doing cartwheels and backflips and all sorts of things on the tarmac. I mean, dangerous just wasn't in it, but they had no fear at all. Anyway, towards the end of the three weeks we were there, we, hadn't, we didn't know it, but in honour of us being there, the school had actually postponed their sports day. And not only that, they'd hired a stadium. And so all the kids got packed into a bus. There were about, I don't know, hundreds of children and about 10 buses, how they all packed in there, I don't know, but they did with almost hanging out of windows and off we went to the stadium. And when we got there, um, we were helping with the organisation of the, the races and things. And Emily was off with the young people and once again doing things that we would probably have never expected to do. At one point we actually heard her up in the commentator's box commentating on the races. And then... Again, we hadn't particularly realized this, but she'd been invited to take part in a race. And we saw her go down onto the racetrack, 
and it was the younger children she was with. So she was actually with the seven-year-old. She's five, and she's Diddy. And they'd shortened the 100-meter race to 50 meters for the younger children. There she was lined up with all these kids. And I remember Stuart and I sort of looking at each other and thinking, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen here? What, what's, what's it going to be like? Anyway, bang, gun, race starts, off they go, and we could hardly look. And then all of a sudden we looked and thought, dear me, there she was, and she must have been about 15 metres in front of everybody else. Well, we just couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe it. After we'd seen all these kids in the yard running around all over the place, we thought she was going to be the tortoise at the back and eventually get to the front. She didn't. She ran the race, and she won the race. And it certainly wasn't because we'd encouraged her to do that. As I say, we'd have probably protected her. But the young people that we were with said, go on, Emily, have a go which actually caused another problem because all of the, the uh, medals had been counted out for each race. And Emily won a gold medal that should have actually been given to another child. How that was overcome, I don't know, but we managed somehow or other to find another gold medal that day. But I think the story is basically, sometimes we hold back, and as parents, we were holding back on Emily, and she was able to do something against all the odds because we would never, ever have expected her to succeed in that particular situation, but she did through somebody else's encouragement. <clears throat> so again, great story. When did you last beat the odds? Think of a time in my life, 10 years old, uh, basically dying really because I'd got a, a malfunction with my kidneys, uh, which nobody ever knew about. I was always a poorly pale little boy, uh, you know, what's wrong with him, he's always tired, he's always sleeping, found out I've got a massive problem with my kidneys, and so 42 years ago, at 10 years old, I had a kidney removed in Sheffield Children's Hospital, and uh, here I stand today, 42 years later, with just one kidney, pretty fit really, I suppose, for a 52 year old, uh, so I beat the odds. Yeah, there was a slim chance it might go the other way, but the odds were beaten. Yeah? Uh, we can think of so many things, and we can all tell a story. That's the thing. We might think we've not got a story to tell, but every single one of us has got a story that we can tell of a time when we've beat the odds. Can we remember yours? Can you be bothered sometimes to beat the odds? Are you sometimes scared about beating the odds. Are you sometimes fearful? Even sometimes, are we too busy sometimes to beat the odds? That's a challenge to us in today's society where it is very, very busy. Are we too busy to beat the odds? We read about so many people who beat the odds. We hear the stories, we can read in the Bible, so many characters that beat the odds as well as Elijah. What we need to do is set aside our limited expectations. What we need to do or strive to do is fall in love or fall in line, whichever you prefer, probably love stroke line with God's expectations. It's not about my expectations. It's not about your expectations. Dare I even say it, it's not about the church's expectations. It's about God's expectations. Now, we all like plans. We all like programs. I want to tell you this morning, plans and programs are very, very good, but they're not top of the league, okay? They're not top of the league because God grows people. He doesn't grow plans. He doesn't grow programs. He grows people. People matter more than plans. People matter more than programs. Programs and plans are important. I'm not saying they're not, but they have their place. People are more important than programs and plans because people matter and God grows people. He can increase plans, he can increase programs, but he can't grow them because he grows people. That's what he's about, growing people. And what we need, some of us, or probably all of us, is for God to invade our lives and if you like, make our lives a beautiful, beautiful mess. The plans that we sometimes have are probably more our plans than God's plans. So sometimes he has to come in 
and invade those plans. And when you feel lost sometimes, which some of us do from time to time, when you feel confused, when you feel at times that perhaps you're overwhelmed, when you feel sometimes that you're wasted, when you reach a crisis point, when things come to a head, when things get on top of us, when it's confrontation time and it's for real, what do we have? We have two options. That's all we have. We have two options. And they are these. We can cling to the crisis or we can cling to Christ. It's a choice. I'm not saying it's easy, but we can cling to the crisis or we can cling to Christ. And we can be the victim or we can be the victor. Again, not always easy, but we, we have a choice. So we can either cling to the crisis or cling to Christ. Be a victim or be a victor. Which is it to be for each one of us this morning? And when we're at this point, we can do as Elijah did. We can watch, we can listen, and we can trust. And we said earlier about uh, God invading our lives and making it a beautiful mess. And you might kind of say, well, what's a beautiful mess? Well, the kind of thing out of his mind is that when there is mess, when there is chaos, when there is disturbance, that's when God does his best work. When there's a mess, when there's chaos, when everything's upside down, that's when God comes along and does his best work. So it then becomes a beautiful mess rather than a mess. And it becomes something that is beyond our expectations. So again, we come back to what is our Mount Carmel this morning? We find it easy, we're good at this, we find it easy to tell other people what their Mount Carmels are, and yet when it comes to our own, we don't see them. Yeah, it's easy to tell each other. And what we should be doing is sorting our own Mount Carmel's out. That's not saying we don't talk to each other and tell each other, because we can. And there's a way to do that. We tell each other in love. Somebody tells you something in love, it's acceptable. Yeah. You accept it. You take it on the chin. You know, you say, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. And that's how it should be. We're not always going to agree on everything, but if we're going to try and talk to each other, then let's do it openly. Let's do it lovingly. Let's do it caringly because we are, in effect, a family. I believe this morning the main thing that God wants to say to us is follow Elijah's example. Beat the odds. Defy expectations. To defy, what does that mean? It means to challenge someone or something in order to prove something. Refuse to obey, go against, disregard. I believe that God wants us to challenge each other. Challenge each other as individuals, challenge each other as a community, challenge each other as a church, challenge each other as a movement, challenge each other as a society. In effect, I think what God wants us to do is throw down the gauntlet. Yeah? Throw down the gauntlet. I'm already, who can remember that program years ago? I used to love it. I don't like it now. Uh, Gladiators. Gladiator, ready. Remember? And then, was it challenger, ready. Yeah? Throw down the gauntlet. And I believe that's what God wants us to do this morning, is challenge our society. Not in a nasty way. There's, there's a nice way of doing things. Challenge our friends. Challenge our family. Life equals risk. Are we risk takers? Do we live life to the full? Do we live life to the max? Risk takers are a little bit crazy at times, a little bit mad at times. Somebody once said this, you've got to kick the darkness until it bleeds daylight. I like that one because it's, a, it's quite physical, isn't it? You've got to kick the darkness until it bleeds daylight. Obedience to God often, well, always really, involves risk, involves courage. We sing that song, don't we, about shouting from the rooftops, I proclaim I am yours, I am yours. I wonder sometimes, do we? 
do we really? We sing it. It's easy to sing it on a Sunday when we're in here. Mark my words. But then when we get out there, are we still singing it? Are we still declaring it? Who knows? Who knows where you work that you're a Christian? Who knows where you live that you're a Christian? Can they tell that we're different? Can they tell that we, I think that person might go to church. Can they tell that we love God? Even more, can our friends? Even more, can our neighbors? Even more, can our family? The people we work with. Defy expectations. Be risk takers. Beat the odds. Let's be part of the beautiful mess. Now we're going to watch a, a quick video and then just a few final thoughts. Just watch this video. We'll come on. A- Dismissed from drama school with a note that read, wasting her time, she's too shy to put her best foot forward. Turned down by the Decca recording company who said, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. A failed soldier, farmer, and real estate agent. At 38 years old, he went to work for his father as a handyman. Cut from the high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. The teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything, and he should go into a field where he might succeed by virtue of his pleasant personality. Fired from a newspaper because he lacked imagination and had no original ideas. His fiancée died, he failed in business twice, he had a nervous breakdown, and he was defeated in eight elections. If you've never failed, you've never lived. line if you've never failed you've never lived i saw a quote the other day fail first attempt in learning it's very good fail first attempt in learning take a limitation that's what god wants us to do take a limitation and turn it into an opportunity take an opportunity and turn it into an adventure by dreaming big by being crazy if you like dream big if you expect life to be easy challenges will seem difficult if you accept that challenges may occur life will be easier there's an old hymn isn't there and the line in it goes like this if all were easy if all were bright where would the cross be and where the fight and it's true you know Life's not going to sail along. It's not going to be perfect. But we have somebody to accompany us. God's grace gives strength to overcome any situation we may be in. And with the power of God, we can scale any wall and adapt to any situation. But without climbing the mountain of hardship, we may never know the joy of hope. If you like this morning, what we need to do is like Elijah, we need to taste We need to smell, we need to experience the adrenaline of victory. You know what it's like when you're a sportsman? You win a game of football, you want the next game to come along because your adrenaline is pumping. You're a boxer, you win a fight, your adrenaline is pumping. You want the next fight. You win a race, you want the next race to come because the the adrenaline of victory is pumping. It's no different for us. And if we get the adrenaline of victory... We will want the next victory and the next victory and the next victory. The human spirit responds to afford who makes the difference. This morning, my challenge to myself and to you is, will it be you? Will it be me? Will it be the church? Where do you stand today? What will your response be? Like Elijah defy expectations and as they say in gladiators people ready 
Church, ready? Thank you. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.